Hi, welcome to the farm. Wisconsin is known for its cheese, and my father and I plan on making cheese right here at our farm, but first we need to learn a little bit more about it. So I'm going to Darlington Dairy Supply to learn about cheese vats, and then it's off to Saxton Creamery to learn about how they do grass-fed cheese at their place. And then a final trip to Door County Cheese to see the aging rooms. And then it's back to the farm to feed up a cheesy, cheesy lunch to the 4-H kids. Gather with us around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Good morning, girls. I'm Inga, and I love everything about farming. Midwestern farms are a bounty of good food made by good people. I love being able to travel to search out good ingredients. Cooking is all about what's seasonal, what's fresh. Every day can be filled with good food, good friends, and a beautiful herd of cows. Welcome to the farm. Good girl. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Quick Trip, Big on Fresh, and proud to support Wisconsin's farmers. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. American Provenance, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. I've invited Dale out to the farm to talk to us a little bit more about 4-H since the 4-H kids will be visiting the farm. Dale, for those that don't know what 4-H is, what is it exactly? 4-H stands for Head, Heart, Hands, and Health, things that we develop in young people throughout their lifespan. 4-H yeah, is a positive youth development pro program for children ages 5 to 18. And we have young people in every single county around the state of Wisconsin where they learn life skills, they learn things that are related to the projects that they might be engaged in. Uh, they learn in small groups and communities with others that have similar kinds of interests. That's great. I grew up a 4-H kid myself, and my brothers and I would take cows to the fair all the time. I got to do cooking demonstrations there. And it really, I didn't know it at the time, but it really helped me in my career now as a dairy farmer and also uh, as a cooking enthusiast. Absolutely. That's one of the things we find with young people in 4-H is that it's not just the skills they learn and the projects they, they take, but it's really the life skills they learn that are really relevant to the rest of their lives. I was surprised when I talked to my nephews this year about their 4-H projects, which are, they're doing archery and photography and things that I never thought about when I was their age doing, and it's really a diverse program. It is, absolutely. One of the things about shooting sports is it's one of the most rapidly growing programs that we offer. And in recent years, with the Hunger Games movies that have come out, girls in particular have really demonstrated a huge interest in archery and learning about that sport. What a great program for kids. What do, you think, what do you see as kind of being that those core elements of 4-H, the learning, the, but it's really, it's, it's a place for kids to gather too, and not just farm kids, right? Absolutely. We talk about some essential elements in 4-H youth development, belonging, independence, generosity, and, um, and independence. And belonging is really something fundamental to all of us and to children everywhere. They're going to be involved where they feel like they do belong. Young people also do community service in 4-H, so expressing generosity to others. And it's one of the things that really leads young people that are in 4-H to become involved in communities later in their lives, uh, being involved on school boards and other, other public organizations. Mm -hmm. And then mastery is what happens in all the projects, really learning and exploring and developing mastery in things that they're interested in. Well, that's fantastic. Well, Dale, thank you so much for stopping by today. Thank you, Inga. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, I'm going to get her back in the barn, and then why don't you meet me down in Darlington, Wisconsin, to learn more about cheese vats. Hello, Ted, right? Hey. Hi, I'm Inga. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> hey, my friend Virgil said to stop in. I was going to be coming through town to learn more about vats, and I'm sure. trying to put a creamery together and trying to get a little bit more knowledge. And this is kind of an original idea. Uh, this is, what do you call this? This is a cheese on wheels. Cheese on wheels, yep. I love that. Why did you want to do cheese on wheels? We had a lot of interest in people like you that wanted to start cheese plants. And, uh, and there's a lot of thinking to do when you try to start out. Floors, walls, ceilings, lighting. There's so many rules. There's the rules and regulations all over. So we just simplified it. We can build this in our plant and it makes it a little less expensive to a point, so. Sure. And easier. 
Well, this might be an option for me. I'm just trying to really research the best option because I want to be as successful as I can. But yeah. I'd also like to look at some other options, uh, some other vats. And you have a store nearby? We can sure, yeah. We can run out to the shop. No problem. Okay, wonderful. Oh, so this is one of your pasteurizers, right? Yeah, this is our human grade batch pasteurizer. So you guys have a whole diversity of products here, right? We do cheese plants all the way from on the farm, small up to plants that run a million pounds a day. That's amazing. And what's this behind you? That's one of our wine fermentation tanks. Oh, cool. You guys have your hands in everything. We also do brew systems uh, for beer all the way from the from the cattle house all the way up to the bright tanks. Now tell me, I'm a multi-generational farmer and you're a multi-generational farm equipment person. Tell me a little bit about the history of this place. Yeah, well, Grandpa came to the United States in 1914. They got married, lived in cheese plants, had five kids born in cheese plants, wow. which dad was one, so he grew up in the cheese industry. He made cheese, went to the service, came back and started Darlington Dairy Supply. And then eventually I started working here, my brothers and I. I got my cheesemaker's license also. I think it's great that the, you guys are a family of cheesemakers because making these cheese vats and this equipment, you really understand what it's like to be on the other end of it. Yeah, it does make a difference if you understand how it works and why you have to do it. And then you can also experiment with things. You guys are this wonderful, uh, I, I would like to say small company here in Wisconsin, but you ship products all over the world. Yeah, we do. We, we've got stuff in China. We've got equipment in Japan. We've got stuff in Russia, South America, Central America, the Caribbean islands, United States, Mexico. Well, when you gave me the tour of the factory, I saw a little cheese vat that I'd like to bring home to my house someday. And since I'm in Wisconsin, would you come down oh, and yeah, install it with me? I already put your name on it. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, keep it here for we'll me because I'll be you. back for it soon. Cool. <laughs> well, thank you, Ted. You bet. Have a great rest of the day. I'm here in Cleveland, Wisconsin at Saxon Creamery. It's important to me before I start this new cheese endeavor that I really research it and find people who have already been successful doing it and learn from them. And that's why I'm here today. So let's go find Lisa and see if I can't learn a thing or two. Hey, Lisa. Hey, hey. thanks for meeting with me today. I'm glad you could come, Inga. Well, I hope I'm suited up correctly. I know that's a big thing for you guys. It is, absolutely. Um, we're a safe quality food certified uh, facility, and it's very important we don't cross-contaminate farm with food. So tell me a little bit about how Saxon Creamery and when it all started and how it started. Oh, sure, sure. Ten years ago, this was uh, uh, an idea that was hatched uh, from the boys at the farm. They wanted to add value to their milk and they've always wanted to make it a, a value product that people would enjoy with their milk. So they decided to start a, a European-inspired cheese factory. I love it. Well, that's one of the reasons that I want to do a cheese too, is having that, that value-added product. It's important because the price of milk, you never know what it's going to be from year to year. And so I think it's a wise decision to be made. Absolutely, and, and, and it, it ages, so it's something that can just keep getting better with age and have like more and more hopefully. value. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, ex just explain, what kind of cheese are you guys making today? Today we're making our pastures cheddar. Okay. Um, and actually with this product we're able to make cheese curds, so we have that, we're going to be selling that today fresh. The you got to have fresh cheese curds. Got to have fresh cheese curds. <laughs> Squeaky ones. Warm from the vat. <laughs> um, we're also putting it in our hoops, and we'll age that at least 12 months, and we'll have a nice English cheddar. That sounds delicious. And by pressing the cheese, you're, it's knitting to is knitting together, but it's also just getting out extra moisture too. It is. Yep. Exactly. Um, whey, although it is is a great byproduct, um, in cheese it's not so much. Um, we really want to extract as much whey as we can because whey inside of cheese can make it spoil. So that's what we're doing right here. We're pushing out any excess whey. And um, as you mentioned, we want to get those curds to knit and so that the wheel is, is real solid. Nice. And then will, will you wrap this? That's the second process. We'll actually take these cheese out of the hoops um, and then we'll put a bandage around the side okay. so that the curd also stays together. And once that cheese is dry, then we'll remove it and paint it and put it in our aging. Can you explain the process of what you're doing? Sure, absolutely. I've had to do a lot of learning myself. Um, we get the milk in from the farm fresh daily. 
Um, we put it through a pasteurization process. We'll add cultures, and the cultures will add flavor, and then we'll add rennet, which will coagulate the milk and, and, and make it firmer, and they'll cut it into curds, take off the whey, and then we make cheese with it. Wonderful. It's pretty much the same process as I think that my dad and I are going to do. So it's, it's nice to see it on a bigger scale, though. Ours is mini. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this is great, uh, seeing how you guys do things here. I'm getting a little hot and humid from being in the cheese making room. Can we go cool off and see how the cheese is aged? Absolutely. Let's go to the aging room. Okay. Inga, this is one of our open air aging rooms here at Saxon Creamery. This is where our cheese gets its character from. Oh, nice. I love it. And tell me a little bit about what the, your process is for aging. Okay, so all of our cheese are put on wood boards that are specially manufactured for us. This is the way they used to do it for many, many centuries. It acts as a sponge. It pulls out the extra moisture oh, in the cheese. Okay. In this in particular, what we do every day is we flip our cheese. Well, on this wheel here, this is our Big Ed's Gouda. We also stamp each one of our wheels um, to signify the day we made it, what kind of cheese it is, what vat, and what year we made it. And this okay. way we can track our cheese uh, to every customer, to where it is in the factory. We can track our cheese through, throughout the whole year. Um, we know who we sell it to. Um, if it's a particular great batch, then we want to make sure we go back to that make sheet and duplicate Do it, again. it. Yeah, that's nice. And what are you what are you painting it with? Is this this is a special paint um, that we have imported in from the Netherlands? It allows the cheese to breathe um, for moisture release and for um, integrity of the wheel. I love it. And different colors for different cheeses. I notice. Yes, absolutely. We tried to make sure that people could tell what cheese it was by the color it is. Um, so we have yellow, we have clear, and we have brown. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you again for taking your time with me today. I'm going to go find out about the other end of the business, which is the cows. I love seeing cows, so I'm going to go visit the farm. Awesome. These are some beautiful looking cows out here. They're in great condition. Well, thank you, Inga. Welcome to Saxon Homestead Farm. And we do have a beautiful herd of cattle. They are, and they're a little crossbred going on in here. What kind yep. of, what's the genetics of this crew? We have a Holstein-based herd that we've crossbred with Jerseys for the last 20 years. So you get this sort of pizza pie mix of black and white cows. Um, and the crossbreeding is absolutely a great thing to do for cattle. They're a little bit smaller. They have black colored feet, black lamina on their, on their feet. Makes them sturdier. They're, they're absolutely um, a little bit better grazers. Okay. Um, they have higher butter fat and protein. Okay. Um, and they're thriftier cattle all around when you crossbreed. Yeah, the, you guys are making your own cheese. Is the pasture does it play an important role in the cheese making process for you? The pasture plays an incredibly important role when we're making cheese. Um, it, the, there's nothing nicer than to see cattle on pasture. Oh yeah. And the cattle um, will represent, or their milk is, is absolutely um, better because of grass. The gorgeous thing about pasturing is, is that as the seasons change, the grass change, the weather changes, and the cattle's milk changes. So you, if you have a great cheesemaker like we do at Saxon Creamery, then he can use the, the milk and the different milk from the different seasons to vary that cheese just a little bit. So we have absolutely seasonally based grass grass-fed or grass-based cheeses as a result of the pasture. I tell you, it's inspiring seeing you guys do it on this level, too. This is a lot of cows <laughs> on pasture. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. That pasture system is environmentally really a safe system. Um, it does the world good. Uh, it's, it, it holds the soil in place. It's really good for the health of the cattle the health of the soil. Also and the birds and the bees too. I mean, it's a great food source for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and it does. The, the pasture birds, the bobolinks, uh, the swallows, the kingbirds all follow the cows and love pasture 
um, for their own homes. Uh, so well, it's, it's, it's nice, a great system. It's nice to meet a fellow grazer. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm gonna go help Carl get started milking. And why don't you meet me up in Door County and we'll discover another creamery. I've made it up to Door County. The cherry blossoms are in bloom and the sun is shining. And now it's time to make the last stop on this trip to Door County Artisan Cheese, where we're gonna learn from Mike about aging cheese in a cave. Let's head over. Hi, Mike. Thanks for meeting with me today. Well, hi, Inga. I tell you what, I've been on a little bit of a cheese expedition. I'm researching. I want to put out a small creamery at my dairy farm. And so I started out with looking at some cheese bats, spend some time on some farms. And now I'm here with you, a master cheese maker. I'm so excited about it. And I want to talk to you about aging. But first, can you explain what a master cheese maker is? Yeah, the master cheese maker program was started uh, in Wisconsin for Wisconsin uh, cheese makers about 20 years ago. And, um, you know, it, uh, it details the specific individual cheese that that cheesemaker has a special skill in. So um, I decided uh, when I had my other uh, job opportunity that I was making blue cheese to get certified in making blue vein cheeses. So it was just fitting for me to do that as I, you know, came along in my career and I've been in in the cheese business my entire life, so. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, for me, I love my cows. That's why I want to make cheeses, to be able to keep my cows on the farm and be able to afford to do that. Uh, my father's more of the cheese maker, uh, but that diet of the cows is so important to me and on, also to my father when it comes to making that cheese. With you, how, how does that figure into your program? Well, I think uh, diet and just general nutrition, everything is so important for the cow. If you don't have good milk, you're not going to make good cheese. Yeah. So we selected a, a company called Red Barn Farms that actually procures milk from small farms, um, small herds like 25 cows or less. Uh, every cow is certified AHA, uh, American Humane Association okay. certification for animal husbandry. So the cows are given a lot of time to, to free range and go out in pasture. And we probably got the best milk that anyone could procure. Well, I don't know. My cows give some pretty good milk, right. too. <laughs> well, we'll have to have you send some over. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, when I first started making cheese years and years ago, we had a cave uh, similar to this one, and my job was to turn the cheeses over yeah. and rub the molds in. Why is it important for you to be aging in a cave? Well, I think the, the, the important thing with us, because of the amount of different cheeses that we're going to produce, um, we, we developed three caves under our cheese-making facility and each one has the ability to create a separate environment. Some cheeses require higher humidities, lower temperatures, some lower humidities, higher temperatures, so on. But we have the ability to change that out. So when I make all these different cheeses, we'll be able to select a cave that is gonna be appropriate for the right kind of aging for the cheese. And it's beautiful down here too. Yeah, yeah, we're very proud. Uh, we put a lot of effort in this and the whole facility is for the enjoyment of all the people that come up to Door County and visit us, but uh, it's also very, very functional. It serves sure. a real good purpose for us. And what cheese do you have here with you this, today? This cheese is actually called a Valmy. It's, uh, it's one of the first original cheeses that we're creating here. This cheese is uh, dedicated to the Belgian community in oh. northeastern Wisconsin. There's a lot of Belgian immigrants that moved up into Green Bay area and north up into the door. So um, I felt that it was fitting that we, we make a cheese that would um, uh, be dedicated to them in honor of them. So it's going to be a soft, medium soft cheese with uh, wash rind on it. And um, I can't really tell you much more than that. <laughs> the, the wash is going to be a little bit of a secret, but it'll be ready in about two months. Well, I look forward to coming back and tasting it. Well, I hope that you do. I got to get back to the farm and start cooking. All but right. thank you for showing me this. These Thanks for stopping caves. by. Yeah. I'm excited to have the 4-H kids out to the farm today. I really enjoy having kids to the farm to be able to show them the horses, the cows, talk about the pigs, and just let them run around and be kids. And at the end of the day, I'm gonna be serving them a little Wisconsin macaroni and cheese. I thought previously about doing a fondue, but I thought well, that could get a little bit messy and maybe that's not the right thing to be serving on a hot summer day. So I'm gonna do a nice little Wisconsin macaroni and cheese. And the star ingredient here is gonna be that Saxon cheese. And if you 
you'll notice, you know, their cows are all pasturing. It was amazing to see 500 cows out on pasture. I've never seen that many cows out all at once. But you can tell that the cows are pastured because the color of the cheese is a little bit darker. It has that buttery sort of yellow color, and that's because the cows are out eating pasture. When the cow's eating that diverse pasture, it just adds a different color to the cheese. So look for that if that's something that's concerning to you. So I've already got some grated up, but I'm going to grate up a little bit more. And this cheese is just really buttery, and the flavor and the texture are just lovely. And I find when working with cheese, it's better to do it when it's at room temperature. The flavors are a little bit more developed then, and it's easier to grate it. Look at that cheese, it's so creamy. I like to use a couple of different varieties of cheeses when I'm making macaroni and cheese. Okay, now we're gonna start with our simple uh, white sauce. That's the base for the sauce for this recipe. We're gonna add a couple tablespoons of butter right to the pan and get this melting. These sauces are nice to learn. They're kind of those basic sauces that are nice to, to know how to do, the classic sort of French sauces, and then you can kind of build a meal around that. Now that the butter's melted, I'm gonna add a few tablespoons of flour, just a little bit at a time, and you wanna whisk that in. So I'm just gonna continue to add that flour, and I'm kind of cooking off that flour taste of it. And this is my family's little secret. We do a little bit of dried mustard. Incorporate that in. And now you're just gonna add milk a little bit at a time. Two and a half cups of milk that we're adding. Whoa, hot potato. Now I turned up the heat a little bit on it. I just wanted to bring it to a little bit of a simmer before I turn it off and add the cheese. When I was a kid growing up, my parents used to make everything homemade. And we, me and my brothers just thought that was just crazy that we had to live in a household where they had to make their own bread. And macaroni and cheese was one of the things that they'd home make too. The first time I went to go visit a friend and they had boxed macaroni and cheese, my mind was blown. I thought, oh, what? The word like being abused at home with those homemade macaroni and cheese and you guys get this box and you just put it in boiling water and it all comes together and that's just so amazing. But now that I'm older, I realize that my parents loved us very much and wanted to feed us really good food. Now that the sauce has come to a simmer, I'm just gonna turn it off and take it right off the heat and slowly add in the cheese. Macaroni and cheese is a simple dish, but it, when you're using good ingredients, like we all should be when we can, it elevates the dish. So simple things can be really great to cook as long as you're using really great ingredients to go in there. And that's why I wanted to use this great cheese. But also, I really enjoy being able to support these local farms who are doing amazing things. And one way to do that is by incorporating their ingredients into what you're cooking. Next, I'm gonna add the pasta, and this is uh, about half a box of elbow pasta that I've already cooked. Now we'll give this a swirl. And then add a little broccoli. My family tradition is also to add a little bit of broccoli into your mac and cheese. Sprinkle that in. Okay, that's mixed in good. I didn't want to have to have plates and silverware for this group of kids today, so I wanted everything to be handheld. So I'm actually going to cook the macaroni and cheese in uh, muffin tins so that they can just pick it up, eat it, run around, and have a good fun. So let's fill these up. Oops. Alrighty. Looking good. I like this kind of finger food, especially with kids. I think they like it too. It's more fun to eat. Okay, and the next little thing that my dad loves to do is add a little bit of potato chips for a crunch on top of the mac and cheese here. Brings me right back to my childhood. I grew up on this very recipe. All right, well that's done and the kids are arriving. So I'm gonna pop these in the oven and let's go out and meet the 4-H kids.
Yummy finger foods, cucumber spears, and carrot sticks with creamy ranch dressing. Sneak a little broccoli into that mac and cheese and bake it in a muffin tin for easy peasy eating. Oatmeal cookies and an ice cold glass of moo, a 4 H classic. I hope this has inspired you to bring some 4-H kids out to your farm and serve them some macaroni. And I hope you'll gather with us next time around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Good job, guys. Now you can eat your cookies. Farm Table is funded in part by Quick Trip, big on fresh, and proud to support Wisconsin's farmers. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. American Provenance, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. <laughs>